This whole talk was supposed to be about the revelation that just came across my desk about the corruptions in the church him now. And you see where it has taken me. Once I get wound up, you can't shut me down. One thing I should point out is that the authors of this document, that's this document here. The authors of this document aren't proposing anything radical other than that we stop singing from the church him now. Beloved, it's too late in the day for something as tame as that. If a million of us threw our church hymnals aside, you think the General Conference cares? I don't believe that whoever put this together has gone far enough. There needs to be some real protest in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, just as Luther protested. And I'm afraid the only language the brethren understand is money, because that's their God. Now here's an exercise in which I'd like you to participate. Those of you with computers or who have access to the Ellen White database, I'd like you to look up the word protest. How many entries do you get? My computer just told me that the word appears 281 times in Mrs. White's writing. Now I'd like you to put one word beside it and hit enter again. That word is time. So you're going to be entering two words, protest and time. What do you get? Though it is used six different times, my computer gives me only one instance, one sentence in which the word protest is used in the same sentence as the word time. Sister White is protesting unfair labor practices in the church, and she decides to do something about the matter. Here's the context, and here's the sentence. Quote, there are ministers' wives, sisters Starr, Haskell, Wilson, Robinson, who have been devoted, earnest, whole-souled workers, giving Bible readings and praying with families, helping along by personal efforts just as successfully as their husbands. These women give their whole time and are told, meaning told by the church, that they receive nothing for their labors because their husbands receive their wages. I tell them to go forward and all such decisions will be revived. The word says the laborer is worthy of his hand. When any such decision as this is made, I, this is why, will, in the name of the Lord, protest. There is that word, protest. When is the last time you protested anything? Now, how did she say she would protest? Quote, I will feel it my duty to create a fund from my tithe money to pay these women who are accomplishing just as essential work as the ministers are doing and this tithe I will reserve for work in the same line as that of the ministers. Hunting for souls, fishing for souls. That's taken from Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, Numbers 1501, 1598, page 360. With that in mind, let me answer the question many of you are asking yourself just now. Brother Mould, what am I to do? You have me somewhat convinced that there's something fishy going on. What am I to do? Leave the church? No. Call the church Babylon? No. But protest. Protest with your tithe, just as Mrs. White did. I don't have time to take you to 1 Samuel to see what the Israelites did when the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were sleeping with the women at the door of the church. The Bible says men abhorred the offering of the Lord. They offered their sacrifices at home. And Mrs. White said it was perfectly acceptable to God. They refused to come into the precincts of the church of God with those corruptions going on. And I tell you, we need to protest. Start returning your tithe to those whom you are certain have the finishing of the work at heart. There are probably thousands of ministries that qualify. You can see some of them at any ASI meeting. The trouble is, those who are ASI members have pretty much agreed with ASI that they would not accept tithe. Well, give it to them anyway. Just don't tell them it's the time. I had to do that for a while when I was supporting a pastor overseas with my tithe. Because I knew if I told him it was tithe, he probably wouldn't have accepted it. Listen, let me wrap this up with two emails I received in the past month. The first is from a sister over in Great Britain who writes, I have really been blessed and do believe in the case of the great hoax. Notice what she calls the book, The Great Hoax that people need to take it up with the church leadership and to challenge them. As for me, I am ready to do that, but I would ask for guidance from you as to the best way of doing, example, who best to speak to. 
you know, I've kind of resisted being thrust into any leadership role. All right, but I'm just reading to you what she said to me. On over in Jamaica, I was introduced to one person who felt that I should be the leader of this. And God didn't call me to manage people. He called me to open my mouth. In the past, she said, I have raised issues with the local conference, but have had no joy. Of course, the matter of tithe, I have decided that I will not return a might to them, but will support independent ministries. To which I responded, now comes the tough part to your letter. Who should you talk to in an effort to make a dent in the great hope juggernaut? Frankly, unless you're a millionaire whose funds would be missed, I don't know that talking to anybody will help. The only language I believe these people understand is money. They will be polite to your face if you're fortunate, but will probably laugh at you behind your back for what they will perceive as your naivete in thinking that they intend doing anything about it. Even if you should find one honest pastor or administrator willing to listen, what would he be able to do? If our own general conference president can't stop this wicked fraud, what impact do you think even one honest administrator will have on this juggernaut? It is going to take collective action to slow, even remotely, to slow this thing down. In my opinion, it is going to take thousands of Seventh-day Adventist lay people boycotting the church with their tithe, giving it to others. Because if you withhold it, that's stealing. Don't steal from God. David Mould isn't advocating that. Give it where you know it will be put to use to help finish the work. It's going to take this kind of protest before anything positive is going to happen. It might even require a well-coordinated march upon the General Conference. A march featuring busloads of frustrated but determined Seventh-day Adventists and the press. In short, thousands of modern-day Martin Luthers willing to nail their theses to the wall before this hoax will be thoroughly weeded out of God's church. I hope I'm not coming across as too pessimistic, but after having spent 40 years in the church, that's how I see it. Over in Washington State, another who was writing primarily about the church hymnal issue because I contacted her via email and told her what I was coming up with. And when she read this thing for herself, I sent her this document. Anyway, she had this to say. I am upset at myself for being asleep for so long. It is not fair that Jesus gave up so much for us and we are so nonchalant about it all. We are sitting on our backsides. Her words, she sound like me. We're sitting on our backsides doing nothing while the enemy makes inroads. I'm really angry that our leadership has allowed this to take place and they are not alerting the body of Christ. They are definitely guilty of that. I now understand the text that asks the question, where are the reapers? Now that I'm alert and fully oriented, as they say in the medical world, I'm endeavoring to do my part. And I pray that God will bless and multiply it. We can no longer just sit idly by and watch the total and utter destruction of God's church right before our very eyes and under our noses. Amen, sister. If it takes too raggedy, and she put a word in there which I won't use. If she takes too raggedy to light the fire in the midst of the camp, then so be it. Anywhere God leads, I will follow. Finally, in closing, now this is David Moore talking. I can't help but think of the unofficial mantra of the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church whenever any meaningful advance in evangelism is suggested. That mantra, of course, is, we don't have the funds. We don't have the funds. We don't have the funds. And they'll chant it if you let them. As often and as long as the craftsmen and idol, idol makers in Ephesus chanted their allegiance to Diana in Acts 19.34. Here, come and read it. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Two hours of saying the same thing. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. What am I saying? If you believe this church doesn't have the money for meaningful, sustained evangelism, and I remember one meeting in, I, I met with the president of the North American Division aboard the Queen Mary. All this was recorded in our previous DVDs, but as I said, I don't know if we're ever going to get them, get the files back. So let me tell you, I met with him. And I told him I had a burden on my heart. At the time, Ron Halverson, Henry Wright, C.D. Brooks, these were my favorites. I said, brethren, you've just printed in the review that 
we are in the top 50 of the Fortune 500. How can we not fund these people? How can we not? We, we have enough money to put them on prime time. What was that guy with the big ears again who used to... Um, oh, Rob Perot, Ross Perot bought prime time to get his message across. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has the money to bribe by prime time from now till Jesus comes. And I ask the question, how come we have such brilliant lights in the church and we're sitting on it and not turning them loose? Elder Bradford, he was the chair of the meeting, you know, um, sort of patted me on my shoulder and told me that it was a good point and they would get back in touch with me. I'm still waiting. Okay, that was in the 1980s. 1980s. Henry Wright, you were there. You can testify the meeting happened. And I called your name. And called C.D. Brooks' name. And called Ron Halverson's name. Elder Bradford said he would get back in touch with me. And like a fool, I believed him. Not a word. When the doors were closed, they probably had a good laugh at this idiot layman who thought that they would somehow release some of the hundreds of millions of dollars they had piled up and turn the laity loose. That's why I bark. I'm not saying anything today that I have not said to the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When you hear that we don't have the money, then you should ask, where is it? Just last year alone, the Seventh-day Adventist Church reported receiving over $2 billion in tithe. $2 billion. Where is it? That picture on your screen, that Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight David Eisenhower reviewing the spoils from an unexpected find in Germany at the end of World War II. The Nazis had stashed some of their hoarded loot in what's known as the Merker Salt Mine. And in 1945, advancing U.S. forces found it. That picture was taken underground. It wasn't until night, and I'll show you some of the gold. There's a picture on the screen of the gold stashed away by the Nazis. It wasn't until 1997, however, that the U.S. News and World Report, while quoting from a then recently declassified Treasury Department memo, published an article in which it was claimed that gold extracted from the teeth of thousands of Jews and Serbs by Ante Pavlic Ustashi in World War II. He was the head of the puppet government of Croatia set up by Adolf Hitler. Under him, some 750,000 Serbs died. Do you know what they were told? Convert or die. That was the option given the Serbs. Convert or die. Convert to what? Convert to the religion of Adolf Hitler, Roman Catholicism. I'm going to do a documentary, God Sparing My Life, on World War II. But we'll save that. All right? <sighs> Pavlidis Ustashi, their goal didn't end up in Merkel's salt mine. But according to a United States Treasury Department memo, it ended up in the Vatican Bank for safekeeping. I hope you're ready for that. Of course, the Vatican would deny it. But the current reticence of the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to expose the Roman Catholic Church as the Antichrist makes me wonder. How far has Vatican infiltration reached in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? If the Jesuits were going to make inroads in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it, just make, it, it stands to reason that they'd make those inroads in the treasury as well. They know, and you and I know, that we can do nothing without money. We can neither print one copy of the great controversy, nor mount an advertising campaign to market it without money. There is simply no doubt in my mind that if the tentacles of the Roman Catholic Church extend to our church hymna, if they extend to the great hope, then they must be even more tightly wrapped around the church's treasury. In light of the secrecy surrounding the true wealth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm constrained to ask this morning, like the gold extracted from the teeth of tortured Jews and Serbs, is the hoarded tithe of the Seventh-day Adventist Church being routinely funneled to the Vatican Bank for safekeeping too? Don't laugh, beloved. We don't know whose money they routinely control or invest. I'm talking about the Vatican Bank. 
And as the great Hope and Church hymnal scream at us, we most certainly don't know what is going on at the highest levels of this church. I, for one, don't believe the infiltration stops with the church hymnal, or the great hope, or B.B. Beach's medal, or Neil Wilson's trash heap statement. I believe it extends to the treasury, and that alone explains the silence of the church. That explains why Ted Wilson has met with a buzzsaw. But I'll stop here. I've said enough. I've given you food for thought. Now you understand why I haven't returned a dime of tithe to this church in over 20 years. I refuse to do it. I funded lay people, and I'll fund lay people to a drop. I do not trust the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you'd be a fool if after what I just shared with you, you trust them too. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, it's that time again when I must appeal to you for help. That time when I must appeal to you to get off the fence. Don't be just a watcher, a viewer of our videos. Help us produce more. Help us go deeper and deeper down the very jaws of the devil with this message. Spend your hard-earned cash on our ministry. Partner with us. For those of you following our ministry, you know that it's our dream to republish this book in my hands by the millions. The first million copies will cost us $4 million just to print. But we're not afraid of that figure. Just as we weren't afraid when Time Magazine told us we needed to pay them $850,000 for a six-page ad in 1990. Back then, as I said, the Lord raised up somebody who offered us $300,000 in one swoop. Trouble is, it came with strings. This time around, I'm again convinced the Lord has his children, some of whom are rolling in money and aren't sure where to put it. They're waiting, begging God for guidance, wanting to be shown by him which ministry or ministries to bless. One thing I can't get out of my thoughts is this, is the picture of a wealthy Muslim or a group of wealthy Muslims whom God will raise up to help us publish this book by the hundreds of millions. I can't shake it. It's a part of me. I just believe those Muslims are out there. Listen. And let me read a few verses from Isaiah 60 for you. I'll put it up on your screen. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. End quote. Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. Ponder that prophecy long and hard, please. I believe it has special application to the time just before the Lord Jesus is to come, when God makes up his mind, so to speak, that he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit and empower his children to go forward. The Gentile is going to come to our life. What does it mean? Let me give you a clue. Did you know that this book, the new illustrated great controversy is already being distributed chapter by chapter in an Australian mass. I don't know the people and they haven't contacted me. But a sister ministry announced it in a newsletter a few years ago. And what do you think has grabbed these Muslims? According to the newsletter, it's the photographs, the over 400 photographs that we placed in this book. If you want to know the history behind these thrilling photographs, all you need to do is to go to our website and look at the interviews we did with Lincoln Steele, editor of Liberty Magazine. It's all there. Now, please don't misunderstand. Don't think for a moment that if you are not a Muslim, we're going to refuse your gift. God forbid. This picture on my mind of Muslims helping us print this book, this is just David Mole's thinking. David Mole dreaming, maybe. 
Fact is, God can use whomsoever he chooses to help fund us. Friend, if you feel him tugging at your heart right now, please don't refuse him. As it is said in the scriptures, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That's Hebrews 3.15. In closing, let me tell you another little story. Right around the time that I began questioning the leadership of the church about its silence and its hoarding of the Lord's money, and that would include the Lord's tithe, that would have been back in the late 1980s, I began praying. If the church was committed to silence, then I would market this book across the world by myself. I began asking God to help me produce the very best edition of the great controversy the world would ever see. And he answered. These photographs have made <laughs> older editions absolutely tame. There's one set of photographs in this book, however, that nail Roman Catholicism to the wall so clearly that I know multitudes are going to stand with us once we can republish this. But my prayers didn't end with my asking God to help me produce the very best edition of the great controversy that the world would ever see. In the 1990s, I began asking him for more. I began asking him to give me the marketing acumen and the resources sufficient for publishing and selling 100 million copies of this book across the world. I'm not ashamed to tell you. That's what I asked God. I'm absolutely positive he answered the first part by helping us produce the best edition. And in placing Islam on my heart, in taking us to Jerusalem, in giving us the ad that he has given us, I believe he has given us all the marketing acumen we will ever need. Our marketing plan, I think, has come straight from the throne of God. Challenge Islam on the gift of prophecy. All that's missing now are the resources to go for. Friend, I'd like to produce an edition of this book even better than the one I'm holding in my hands. This one will again be hardcover. I'm talking the one to come. It will be stitched, not glued as this one is. And it will contain even more damning photographs. That's why we're making this appeal for partners. If you own a copy, then help us make the next edition even better. If you don't own a copy, I ought to tell you that we have none for sale right now. But with your help, we'll do the work and produce something that I believe will make heaven smile. I am sitting on the edge of my seat. Let me hear from you.